Okay, so today we're going to talk about period three, which is 600 to 1450, all right? I want you guys to try to bring up a couple things that, that like are going to delineate these two years. Why have historians decided on this periodization? Why have they decided on 600 as a year to stop the classical period and now to bring in this now post-classical age? And then why 1450 on the other end of this? So, so what's, what's our line at 600? What's kind of going on that's different about post-600 compared to to before the year 600, and then we'll talk about 1450, what's going to be ending and beginning with, with 1450. So what would we throw out for the 600? Um, what's that? Okay, a development of a new religion. Very good. So a, a new religion in, uh, in Islam. And um, last week, I believe, we talked about the idea of universal religions. Islam is absolutely going to be a universal religion. Uh, we'll talk in a few minutes, but remember, Islam is born in what part of the world? Arabia, very good. It's certainly in Southwest Asia. It's the Middle East, however you want to phrase it. Islam is born in the Middle East, but today there are far more Muslims that don't live in the Middle East than there are Muslims that live in the Middle East. Uh, we've talked in my class, the most populous Muslim nations in the world are what? Indonesia. Indonesia. Pakistan, India, these are the nations with the most Muslims in the world, and none of them are actually in the Middle East. So the development of Islam, and I, that is one year, like, I don't have a lot of years that I require students to know, but one year that I think you guys should have as a, as a year that is burned into your memory banks is 622 as the birth of Islam. So if you get any kind of question that has like a, uh, 200 to 1,000 or something like that, or, or 400 to, to 1,300. You know that we've got the development of Islam, and that's going to cause major historical changes um, with, with that. So development of Islam, very good. What else is, is marking this line uh, at 600? Yeah. Okay, we've got the, the expansion of already existing trade routes, right? Um, and that's where we're going we're gonna to start uh, today. We're going to talk about trade, uh, which is actually 3.1 of the, of the AP. So, so the trade that had already existed, um, and we've talked about four classical trade routes, and we can see them behind me. Uh, we talked about four classical period trade routes. Those trade routes already in existence, are going to continue in existence, and they're all going to grow and become even more vibrant than they had been before. So those four classical trade routes that will continue in the post-classical era and even continue into the early modern era as, as we go later, uh, they are, of course, give me one. Silk Road, Silk Road very good. Give me two. Trans-Saharan, uh, I mix them up. Trans-Saharan uh, trade routes. Third, Indian Ocean sea lanes, and then fourth, Mediterranean, very good. These four are still going to exist. They'd exist before, and they're going to continue and expand even more. What else should we throw out there for, like, important lines between 600, before and after 600? Yeah. You're going to come much later. Renaissance much later. Yeah. Very good, very good. New empires. Excellent. So notice what we have here. In the, in the three big things that you guys just brought up, We've got one trade, it's kind of an economic idea, right? One, a new religion, kind of social, cultural idea. And then finally, the development of new empires. Uh, prior to 600, we're going to have the collapse of what we call the classical empires, whether it be Han, China, which happens earliest around, uh, around uh, the third, early 3rd third century CE, um, the Western Roman Empire with the fall of Rome in the 5th century, the Gupta dynasty, uh, the, the Persian empires in the, the 6th century, right? Um, so we've got the fall of classical empires, and then we're going to have the rise of new states or new empires. What new empires are we going to see in period three? Very good, the caliphates. What else? Byzantine, very good. Now, Byzantine is kind of a weird example, right? What is unique about the Byzantine empire? What's that? It, it is Rome, yeah. So Byzantine is like a historian's creation. Uh, the Byzantine Empire is 
is not so new, it's just got a more recent new name. We like to think of it as unique. But the Byzantine Empire is really just a continuation of Rome. So when we talk about empires at like the United States of America today, what are we, like 200 and pushing 250 years old? Uh, the Byzantine Empire, if we date the start of the Byzantine Empire with the beginning of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire is going to live to be about 1,500 years old. So that is the longest lasting empire that, that we cover in this class, right? Um, and, and certainly, it's continuous throughout that time. We can't even talk about the Chinese dynasties being continuous, because the Han dynasty falls in the 3rd the century, and we don't have the rise of what dynasty in China? The Sui dynasty, um, until the 6th century. So we've got a few hundred years uh, in China of warring states with no centralized state. So we've got uh, new states. We've got uh, the rise of the caliphates. We've got the re-centralization of China. The Sui Tang Song, Sui Tang Song. And then we've got a brand new empire on the scene um, that will conquer China, create the Wan Dynasty, but create the biggest land empire in human history, and that's Mongols. Mongols. Very good. So the Mongols are... Uh, the Mongols are a, uh, a, an, a hugely important aspect to this third uh, period of, of world history, this post-classical era. And the Mongols are unique because they don't originate as like one of these traditional civilizations. How are the Mongols different from the Romans or the Byzantine or the Caliphates or, or the, uh, any of the Chinese dynasties? Yes, ma'am. Uh, go ahead. They, they move around a lot. Because how do they make their livelihood? Are they, are they sedentary farmers? No. They're very good. These are pastoral nomads. Very good. From, from Central Asia. So it's kind of odd that, um, that they will become what they become. And really it's only because they've got such a tremendous leader in the founder of this Mongol empire. And that's Genghis Khan. Right? And we'll talk about him in a couple minutes. Um, we've got uh, uh, 600 to 1450. We've got a couple new states that we should also bring up. Any, any others that we haven't thought about yet? Okay, we've, we are going to talk about a couple important American empires. Uh, Inca, Aztec, predating both of those, the Mayans. Uh, good. Um, we've got a, in Eastern Europe, uh, north of the Byzantine Empire, a new state developing. Kind of very loosely confederated state. Feudalism in Western Europe, yeah, we don't have a really strong centralized state in Western Europe, uh, but what about in Eastern Europe, north of the Byzantine Empire, that develops along trade routes? Yes? Very good. Kievan Rus. All right. So we've got some economic ideas, we've got some social cultural ideas, and then of course we've got some political ideas that are going to drive um, uh, history in what we call the post-classical era. We're going to start with the trade stuff, okay? Start with the economics. Uh, we already mentioned these trade routes that are born are going to continue. These trade routes that are born are going to continue. But there are other newer trade routes that we now need to, to bring up, all right? Um, I want to mention trade routes particularly in the Americas. And this is where we're going to talk about the Incan Empire. The Incan Empire is going to have very tight government control over their economy. It's sometimes referred to as Incan socialism. The government really controls a lot of what the Incan government controls, the, the economy within the Incan Empire. And one of the most important things that the Incan Empire is going to do to facilitate trade is going to be the construction of roads throughout the Incan Empire. And that's particularly hard where the Incan Empire is located because of what geographic aspect? The Andes Mountains, very good. They're building these roads high in the mountains. It's made even more challenging, and it's even more impressive that they did it, that they are constructing these roads high in the Andes Mountains without what? Without wheels, without horses, or other beasts of burden uh, to contribute to this road building. But road building is an important aspect of the facilitation of trade by a central state. We mentioned that last week. Every state builds roads. It's how goods are going to make it from point A to point B. It's how internal trade is completed. Uh, but road building is, is essential, all right? And it's going to continue into this period. When things continue in history, we consider them continuities, all right? And you might get questions. 
questions about continuities and changes. I'd also like to talk about uh, the facilitation of trade in China. Particularly, there's two really important rivers in China. One more to the north, one more to the south. The northernmost river goes way back in Chinese history to being one of the most important river valley civilizations or bases of an early river valley civilization. What Chinese river is that? That is the Yellow River or the Wanghe River, right? Uh, H-W... H-E. H-W-A-N-G, H-E. The Wanghe River is the Yellow River because it kind of gets this like yellow, they call it loess, I believe how it's pronounced, uh, silt uh, blowing in from the Gobi Desert kind of gives the, the river a little bit of a yellowish uh, tinge. Um, and then the important river to the south in, of the Yellow River is what? Anyone recall that one? The Yangtze. The Yangtze. The Yangtze. So you've got the, the Wanghe in the north and the Yangtze in the south. And during the Sui Dynasty of the 6th century, they're not going to last for very long, but from about 560, for about 20, 30 years, the Sui Dynasty um, is going to be in power, maybe, maybe about 50, uh, going to be in power. What do they do that helps facilitate trade in China? Very good. Grand Canal. So they're going to dig uh, the beginnings of what is the Grand Canal. Later dynasties are going to expand on that. All right? So, yes, ma'am. Which dynasty? Did you say? The Sui Dynasty. Uh -oh. Uh, they're going to dig the Grand Canal. And this is going to be just like the building of roads. It is to facilitate trade. It's internal, right? It's just helping out the Chinese. But this is hugely important. And this is the kind of thing that good Chinese dynasties do, right? They're very concerned about their people eating and their people having enough food in lean times. And the uh, something like the, the Grand Canal is going to facilitate trade between northern China, which maybe produces more like wheat uh, as a grain and Southern China, which produces what crop more? Rice. rice. Very good. So you're going to have, uh, when there's a lean season in the north, you can supplement it with rice from the south now more easily. So this is going to be uh, a benefit to internal trade. I'd also like to talk about those Silk Roads, right? Um, the Silk Roads are obviously going to be ever-present. They're not really ever going to disappear completely. Although during that like 300 year period after the fall of the Han Dynasty, where there is no centralized government kind of keeping things safe on the Silk Road, remember, why are we always safe to drive down our streets and not feel like we're going to be robbed left and right? Well, because there's laws and there's police. There's a central government that watches over us and, and gives punishments for crimes. And most people think that the crimes that they might commit wouldn't be worth the punishments that they could receive for committing them, right? In the absence of a centralized government, all, everything can go crazy, right? When there's no one to punish you for your wrongdoing, there's a lot of bandits and things that can happen along the roads. So in the absence of a strong centralized Chinese state, um, or in the absence of a per strong Persian empire or even a, a stronger Byzantine empire, that Silk Road is going to decline in, a, in the amount of trade that, that passes through it, right? But then in the, the, the 1300s, uh, the late 1200s and into the 1300s, when we've got the Mongols ruling not just China with the Wan Dynasty, but actually uniting the entirety of the territory that is encompassed by the Silk Road, um, we're going to have a lot more trade on the Silk Road. The Mongols are a centralized state that makes Silk Road trade safer. Cool, Leo? Brilliant. Um, there's going to be new uh, trading cities that will develop in importance during this, uh, this post-classical era. Um, a number of them are going to be located along the East African coast. What do we collectively refer to these cities as? Swahili city-states. Very good. And then some cities uh, along Arabia, because we, of course, see the development of Islam. And Islam, or, or Arabia, which was previously a very much divided pastoral society. What do we call those pastoral nomads that live within Arabia? <laughs> We're throwing out every B word we remember from this year. The Bedouins, the Bedouins, very good. The Bedouins are in Arabia. The nomadic pastoralists in Arabia are Bedouins. The nomadic pastoralists of North Africa are Berbers, all right? And then I think I heard someone say boars. Those are those f Dutch farmers in South Africa. And then I think I heard someone say boyars. Those are Russian, uh, Russian, we're all over the map. Russian nobles are the boyars. So um, I, I, if you weren't on my base, we've got, we've got Bedouin, Berber, boar, boyars, bears, beets, and Battlestar Galactica, right? It's The Office. It's a show you guys will probably watch in about 50 years, and you'll love it, okay? 
All right, excellent. Um, they only watch movies and shows from, from about 50 years ago and beyond? Okay, more than 50. Now, is there a rule, like, when you guys are in your 60s and 70s, can you watch things from, like, today? <laughs> or is it always going to live in the mid-20th century? We'll see. Okay, I can't wait to find out. Anyway, um, so we got some, with the, the new Swahili city-states and the trade uh, within the, the Arab world. This is really going to grow with the spread of, of Islam and the growth of Islam as a dominant civilization, all right? I mentioned Swahili city-states, S-W-A-H-I-L-I, the Swahili city-states. Swahili is a new language that is going to be developed during this period. It is an intermingling of the Arabic language and more traditional African Bantu languages to develop a new language. We'll talk about the Bantu migrations in just a minute here, okay? Uh, so uh, we've got new trading cities on the east coast of Africa and obviously growth throughout the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean trade network is going to experience the most growth in this post-classical era largely because of the growth of the Islamic civilization and the wealth of the Islamic civilization taking part in it. Coolio, you should be able to associate some trade goods with all of the major uh, trade routes. It's easy, though, because it's all virtually the same as it was in the previous. So what kind of goods would we be dropping on the Silk Road besides silk, we could say? Yeah, it's easy. What, what about Indian Ocean? Spice is very good. Um, you're also going to see like some lumber going across because remember, like big, heavy, uh, hard to transport items can actually more easily be done over sea routes than we would ever see over something like the Silk Road. Silk Road trade tends to be only dealing in very like expensive, comparatively lightweight luxury goods. Yes. And, and you would see some cotton uh, coming out of India much more later once the British are going to get involved in in. Uh, our period five. Uh, so that will be traded. Uh, Mediterranean Sea, olives, olives wine, cotton, uh, again, making it from maybe Egypt into Europe. Um, and then the Trans-Saharan, gold. gold, salt, and then a tremendous increase in the slave trade, a tremendous increase in the slave trade. Um, why will the slave trade be increasing in this third period? This is 600 to 1450. So the Europeans aren't really very much involved yet. Why are we going to see a big increase in trans-Saharan slave trade even as early as, as the 7th century? What's that? Very good. They're going primarily to the Arab world. Um, it, it's, yes, ma'am? Oh, good point. Yeah, there's a prohibition against the enslavement of Muslims by Muslims. So you got to go get non-Muslims to enslave. Um, and and because there's going to be such tremendous wealth developed within the the Islamic world, there's going to be wealth to spend on on human cargo on slaves. Um, so so that will absolutely be there. Um, there's going to be some new technologies and new developments that will aid and facilitate this, this trade. Um, I'd like you to remember the phrase, and I'm going to kind of put a bunch of dots, especially along um, some in the, uh, the Trans-Saharan, but certainly along Central Asia. Uh, if you remember the phrase caravan, Sarai. Caravan, that should be an N, Sarai. Caravan Sarai are like way stations, stopping points. They're kind of like you're driving down south, you're going to Florida, and you see that like corner of the expressway where there's maybe four different hotels and a couple gas stations. Uh, that's, the, that's a modern version of a caravan Sarai. We remember that a caravan, um, not to be confused with a caravel, one little word changes the meaning from a bunch of camels riding across the, the, uh, the desert to a bunch of uh, ships or a, a Spanish ship going across the ocean. Caravan, camels, Caravel, a Spanish ship, right? Um, so the caravanserai and the development of camel saddles. Um, a, a camel saddle that can be put upon the back of a camel and they can actually carry uh, people or more goods across the, uh, the desert there. There are also going to be new navigational technologies that will be developed um, and, and spread during this period. Talking about the magnetic compass. The astrolabe, very good. So how we can use the stars to, to uh, figure out what time it is and, and where exactly we are. Um, bigger ships, but then the, the traditional designs are still going to be there, too. We're going to see those ships with their triangular sails. What are those? 
the Latin sails that can tack against the wind. It's going to be um, ever-present, right? There will also be a requirement to understand um, natural processes. For example, seasonal winds in the Indian Ocean that will drive, what, depending on what season it is, sailors from Africa into India or from India back down into Africa, depending on the season. And what do we call those seasonal winds? Monsoons. Very good. Um, and then this last thing to, to note, um, new economic uh, uh, ideas, new economic developments, new financial tools that will facilitate trade as well. Um, credit. Uh, I trust you that you'll pay me back later, so I'm going to let you take this thing now so you can pay me back later. So the extension of credit. Um, Western Europe, in Italy, up in Northern Europe, we had the first credit houses where, where you could have a line of credit much like you guys could have a credit card today. Uh, the coining of, of money that's always been around, the minting of money. Um, and I, take that back. Nothing's always been around. It's been around since the classical period. But what will be new is the development of paper money. Um, so there will actually be, uh, in China, paper currency. And also what is known as flying money. Uh, and these are kind of like, more like checks. Uh, like we would write a check and someone else could could give us goods for that uh, that check, um, or uh, they could give us uh, maybe cash in exchange for that check. Um, this was the idea of flying money, and this is going to be facilitated by the government of China uh, in the Tang and Song dynasty, but it's going to make trade along the Silk Road much safer, because you can only, like, only the guy to whom the check is written to can cash the check. So if some bandit robs you on the road and you got a bunch of gold, he's going to take your gold and you're out of luck. But if he takes your flying money, he doesn't have anything to really do with that because he can't prove who he is. Just like if you lose a checkbook, um, someone shouldn't be able to find your checks and just start cashing a bunch of checks because people should be looking at signatures and, and trying to check the identity of somebody to make sure they are who they're supposed to be. Um, there will also be the development of some trade organizations in particular. The one that we talk about most is the Hanseatic League. The Hanseatic League. Um, this is a northern European trade organization that will connect like as far west as the city of London uh, to as far east as the city of Novgorod. Oh, let's go even further north. As far east as the city of Novgorod in Russia. Please remember that we talked about like the Chinese dynasties establishing rules for trade, right? Western Europe, Northern Europe does not have any centralized state that controls it all. So individual merchants and traders are going to organize themselves into a league, a Hanseatic League, that makes rules for trade. All right. So they will facilitate banking and lines of credit. They will provide safe passage for ships and, and, and what we would call like passports, the ability to pass through a port uh, for ships. Uh, they will eventually provide security and even like a, a pseudo military force for, um, for merchants within this area. So they have to do it because they don't have a centralized state like some of these other places might. Coolio? Cool. Period three also talks about um, long-distance migrations of, of people. And there are two really important ones that we need to know for AP World. First is in Central Africa uh, with the Bantu people going to South Africa and to East Africa. The Bantu migrations, these are happening over many centuries. It is not one Bantu guy that woke up in the morning and said, you know what, I'm done with this place, I'm moving. It is his children or his grandchildren will move further south. And then his children and grandchildren will move further. And then his children and grandchildren will move further. And eventually, after many, many centuries in sub-Saharan Africa, we'll have the spread of these Bantu people throughout the southern part of the African continent. There are a few important things that every AP World student needs to know about the Bantu migrations. Number one, very good. They knew how to work with iron. We call it metallurgy, the ability to work with metals. And they were iron workers. And there's two things we use iron for, weapons and tools, uh, farming implements, right? So the Bantu people were, were um, iron workers. They also were farmers. They used a lot of those iron tools as farming implements, right? So they farmed. They're going to have an impact on the environment as they move across because they are sedentary farmers. So as the Bantu people spread, 
they'll take more of the earth under their control and actually change what that land looks like. Uh, so the Bantu people are agricultural, they know how to work with metal, they spread and they take their language roots with them. Okay, so as they're spreading, a common language family, just like today uh, Italians and French people and Spanish and Portuguese speak all what we call romantic languages, romance languages, uh, because they all are based on originally Latin, the language of Rome. There's a Bantu root that's going to spread uh, through uh, through Africa. You can't play with that, dude. I need that. Um, so anyway, Bantu migrations. One. Two. And we don't have a good map here, so let me just put Australia on the map, and then there's a bunch of islands around here, right? And then there's South America. Um, the Polynesian migrations. Don't forget the Polynesian migrations. Very similar in nature, like or at least of their effects, as the Bantu migrations. But Bantu migrations are over land. Polynesian migrations are over the seas, right? Something as obvious as that is okay to write about. If you had to compare and contrast or bring up similarities and differences, you can write about something even obvious. Don't ever be afraid of the obvious. But like the Bantu, the Polynesians are farmers, and they're going to farm, and they're going to raise animals. In particular, one animal of the Polynesians is going to have a tremendous impact on the environment wherever they go, and that is the pig. And here's where we remember Moana, and she's got her little pig. I forget the guy's name. The pig didn't have a name? Didn't the chicken get a name? Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Did the pig head have a name? No. It's not, well, because you know what happens to the pigs. You, yeah, you, you, you cook them in an underground uh, barbecue, basically, right? So maybe you don't want to get too attached. It's kind of sad. That, that'll be coming out in Moana 2. Moana 2 is way darker than Moana 1, right? Yes. It's Pua. Pua? Yes. Excellent. And I think... I think that is just the name, like when you go to a, when you go to a luau, I think that's the name of the, the type of pig that you eat, I believe. Okay, excellent. Anyway, yeah, I don't think I'm going to take my kids to see Moana too. Um, so Polynesians, Polynesians spread um, from the South Pacific, from island to island to island, all the way across the, the Pacific Ocean. They eventually populate Hawaii. They make it as far east as Easter Island um, in, um, off the coast of South America. They are going to take agriculture with them as well and obviously have an impact on the environment. And they are going to take, um, uh, da, da, da. they're going to take impacts on the environment. They're going to take their language with them as well. So there's a common language route. So you could hop into various islands of the South Pacific and say aloha, and that will be a word in, in not just in Hawaii, but in many other Polynesian lands. Coolio? In addition to talking about travel and trade, we want to talk about two important guys that are going to make their way and see much of the world, but even more importantly, write about much of the world that will inspire future travelers. Uh, so first guy, let's talk about the Italian first. Uh, starts in Italy and makes his way all the way to China uh, to go to the court of Kublai Khan during the Wan Dynasty, and that is, of course, Marco Polo. There is some historical debate as to whether he actually made it all the way there or he just wrote about what he heard about what China was all about. But regardless, AP World still fits him into this long-distance traveler that wrote a lot and will certainly inspire other future travelers by his writing. So Marco Polo. And then the guy that looks at Marco Polo and says, I will take what you have done and travel even further all throughout what we would call Dar el Islam, and that it, with even a hop into China. Check that out. Who is that guy? Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta. Very good. Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta are both doing their travels in the 14th century, right? Um, and so they're kind of contemporaries of each other, uh, seeing a, a massive chunk of the known world at the time. But for both of them, why they're truly important? Like, had these guys not, dude? I'm recording this, man. You gotta stop it. Um, the you can see my son's head in the lower left hand corner popping around. You're on TV right now. Um, <laughs> literally, like tens of people might see this, so don't screw around. This is this is serious stuff. So um, Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo. What's important about them is they write about it. If you travel but you don't keep a diary. History will never know about your travels, right? So because they wrote about it, their books got published. It's going to inspire future travelers um, going down the line. Coolio? Coolio. The last thing that I want to talk about, and I want to maybe uh, use this as a link to the next big topic that we want to handle, 
is just the development of that Dar al Islam in and of itself as a connection to societies connecting with each other through trade and, and migrations and whatnot. With the creation of the Islamic world beginning in 622 and the massive and rapid expansion of Islam by the year 750, right? We're going to have Islam stretching from Arabia all the way across North Africa into Spain. And by the next 50 to 75 years, we're going to see it pushing further and further east. Thank you very much. Further and further into the east, into uh, uh, what is today um, Iran. Um, Islam is going to connect parts of the world that had previously never had much connection with each other. So there's going to be a lot of trade and cultural exchanges within the lands of Dar al-Islam. And that's going to eventually stretch from, thank you, from North Africa, uh, in, including Spain, all the way across, including Arabia, the northern part of Italy. Do you guys remember the name of the uh, Islamic State in northern Italy or northern India? I said Italy. Correct me. Uh, northern India is called the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi Sultanate, and then stretching down into the islands of Malaysia. Um, we're going to see Islam ex or Islam expanding through a couple means. Uh, First, Islamic, uh, the, the expansion of Islam was primarily due to military expansion, right? This was a, an expansion of, of warriors and soldiers who are pushing the boundaries of the earliest Islamic caliphates. But as time pressed on, we're going to see other areas, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, that get connected to Islam, and Indonesia that get connected to Islam, not being driven by military now, but being driven by... Yeah, economic, merchant activity, trade activity, right? So Islam is going to spread through trade. Islam is going to spread originally through military activity. Islam also spreads um, in some sense through missionary activity. Like, not necessarily people expressly going out to convert people to Islam. Remember, the earliest caliphates were not too excited about converting everybody to Islam because once you've converted to Islam, now you don't have to pay the, the jizya tax to the Islamic State. Um, but... Um, they weren't expressly worried about converting, but there, there would be. As Islam would spread, um, people would just be attracted to this new faith that they would be hearing about. Um, Islam was also very attractive to, to leaders of states uh, because within the Islamic world, within the Islamic world, we've got the idea in the caliphate. Now I'm kind of moving this into 3.2. Uh, within the Islamic world, we've got uh, this idea of the leader of the faith and the leader of the state being one and the same. So when Muhammad founds the religion of Islam, he is the leader of an Islamic state, and he is the leader of the Islamic faith. All right. Very early on, of course, Muhammad dies, and he doesn't name a successor. So we got a question over who's going to be the true successor to Muhammad. And what's that Arabic word we use for the successor to Muhammad? That's the caliph, right? Uh, and, and so who's going to lead the caliphate? Is it going to be some respected individual, maybe like uh, Abu Bakr, who is one of Muhammad's right-hand men? Or is it going to be somebody more in the line of the family of Muhammad, which is a little tough because Muhammad doesn't have his own son, but he's got a son-in-law. Um, those that believe that any respected individual could be the leader of the Islamic faith, those become what branch of Islam? They become... Sunni Muslims. Those that believe it's got to be in the line of Ali as a son-in-law of Muhammad, they become the Shia Muslims, right? Um, and this is going to create an early division within the Islamic world. Um, when we talk about the Islamic states that will continue, um, we primarily refer to the two main caliphates. The Umma, and, and these are, of course, um, going to be Sunni. Uh, the, the, these earliest caliphates are led by caliphs that are not in the line of Muhammad. Whether it's the Umayyad or the Abbasid caliphates, these are Sunni. They, just any respected individual that gets the support of the people or the, the Ummah, the Islamic community. So the Umayyad caliphate and the Abbasid. A, B, B, uh, or A, B, B, A, S, I, D. The Abbasid caliphate. Umayyads are about 650 to 750, and the Abbasid Caliphate from 750 all the way up until 1258, but it's going to be pretty weak by 1258. Who's going to crush the Abbasid Caliphate by 1258? Who sacks their capital at Baghdad? The Mongols. Very good. If you are a dynasty and you are being destroyed in this post-classical period, there's a good chance it's the Mongols bringing you down. 
So the, uh, the Umayyad Caliphate uh, and then the Abbasid Caliphate following. There are also a couple smaller like sub-regions of the Islamic world that, that kind of run separately. Um, in the northern part of India, we mentioned the Delhi Sultanate. Um, as the Abbasid Caliphate becomes less centralized, um, what we call Al-Andalus or Andalusian Spain, um, Islamic Spain, kind of starts to run itself um, independently, right? Please remember that the Umayyad Caliphate was very much an Arab-centric Islamic republic, right? Or Islamic, shouldn't call it republic, that's like no king, no, no caliph, uh, Islamic state. Uh, the Arabs got precedence, and that's going to lead in part to the downfall of the Umayyad Caliphate, whereas the Abbasids were much more willing to give other kinds of people, particularly all the Persians that are going to be brought into, into the uh, Caliphate, uh, they're more willing to give them a powerful role within the state. Um, as such, the Umayyads establish a capital in the city of Anybody? Damascus, Syria. Very good. Whereas the Abbasids, kind of giving more of a nod to the Persians um, and, and where a lot of the, the wealth and power within that caliphate would be. Further to the east, they establish a new capital. They build a new city called what? That's Baghdad. Very good. And it's going to be Baghdad that the Mongols are going to sack in 1258. So that is very briefly the, the Islamic caliphates. Um, the Mongols are the other state that we should definitely recognize. Um, born in the 13th century with the conquest of Genghis Khan. They're going to be much more short-lived. All right. I think the Mongols are much more driven by like this this dynamic and powerful leader Genghis Khan, and then his immediate sons and grandsons that take over the the, the empire after he dies. Uh, the Mongols really only have their high points in the 1200s and early 1300s. All right, but for their brief time period, they conquer the biggest empire that the world had ever seen. After Genghis Khan dies, his empire is divided amongst his sons and grandsons. Um, we're going to have uh, essentially what is the, the Yuan dynasty in China. We're going to have um, a, a, uh, the Khanate of the Great Khan, it's referred to as, but it's basically China. The Golden Horde, which is right up here, and it's going to be the ones that push further into Russia. And then a couple of that, I don't know that you need to have memorized, uh, there's one known as the Jagadai in Central Asia and the Il Khanate in the Middle East. But basically, the, 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 the Genghis Khan's empire that he creates doesn't stay united and centralized for too long. It's broken up into four more easily administered regions, kind of like what Alexander the Great does. Alexander the Great in the 4th century BCE creates a massive empire, dies, leaves his empire to four trusted generals, right? And this is a way that, that some states are going to decide how do you rule like a massive territory? Well, you break it up into more smaller administrative zones, all right? Um, I guess what's most important about the Mongols is their facilitation of trade and their connecting of the Eastern world with the Western world. They're going to facilitate ideas and technology back and forth across the East and West. The Mongols are very tolerant. Uh, they, they accept a number of religions. For example, uh, the Mongols in the Golden Horde that eventually kind of make tributary states out of the Russian uh, city-states, the Mongols of the Golden Horde, they're Muslims. All right? Original Mongols, these are like animistic people, uh, shamanistic people. They see spirits and nature around them. But some are going to ultimately become Muslims as they uh, move into the Islamic world. All right? Uh, so they're going to facilitate a lot of trade and cultural ideas going from east to west. Please know that things like paper, printing, gunpowder will make its way from, from China, where it developed, to the western world in large part because of the Mongol expansion. You should also know that not everything that is going to move because the Mongols are connecting the world is a positive. Uh, diseases. The Black Plague that's going to make its way all the way to western Europe by the mid-1300s starts out in China and moves so successfully across uh, Asia, largely because the Mongols have created more of a united empire uh, across Asia. Cool? A couple other states to mention. We mentioned briefly the Byzantine Empire. Uh, please know that the Byzantine Empire is going to have its height very early on in the 6th century under the uh, rule of Justinian. 
So the Byzantine Empire, it's the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, if you can find where Istanbul is or Constantinople is, it's where Europe uh, kisses uh, Turkey here. Uh, so it's the meeting place of Europe and, and Asia. So the Byzantine Empire completely surrounds the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, originally uh, also including down into Arabia a little bit. Uh, but as um, we get to Justinian in the 6th century BC, the 500s, Justinian is a Byzantine emperor that wants to like recreate what, what Rome once had. Please remember, he wouldn't have called himself Byzantine. He would have called himself Roman. He wanted to recreate what the Roman Empire once was. He's not all that successful. He gets some of Italy back, but not much more than that. And ultimately, it's very costly for the Byzantine Empire. Unfortunately for the Byzantines, we're going to have the rise of Islam in the 7th century, and now you've got a tremendous rival to the Byzantine Empire that will almost immediately be pushing back at the territory that the Byzantine Empire will hold. Like the Islamic Caliphates, the Byzantine Empire have the notion of what we call Caesaro-Papism. You should know that phrase. you guys remember that? Caesaro-Papism. The Caesar and the, and the leader of the church, the Caesar and the Pope are, are one, uh, or are, are in one position. So in the Eastern uh, Byzantine Empire, the leader of the, the state was also the leader of the faith, similar to what we're going to see in the Islamic world, right? Um, this period also, we should note the feudalism of, of Western Europe and the feudalism of Japan. Both of these states will, or both of these societies will lack a strong centralized state. In the absence of a strong centralized state, weak central state, we have the rise of importance of landlords. And so we're going to see a, a, a mirror image of each other between Europe and Japan. In Western Europe, you've got powerful landlords and then their vassals, their their, their knights that pledge their service and their, their military service to them. And then we're going to see the serf population that provides the labor uh, in turn for protection from the lords. In Japan, the lords, same idea, we just call them daimyo. Um, and they have, instead of knights, they've got samurai that pledge their service to them. And then they, of course, have peasant laborers that provide labor for the lords in turn for protection, so very similar. What's important to note in terms of world history is that in this time period, Islam, uh, the Islamic caliphates are important, China is important, Byzantine Empire is important, no strong centralized government in Western Europe, no strong centralized government in, in Japan, so they were going to really lag behind those other states in terms of developments and, and wealth and power, right? Um, last but not least, we go over to the Americas. Uh, we talked about the rise of the Inca and the rise of the Aztec. These are two important states uh, within uh, Mesoamerica. They both have their rise in the 1400s. All right? They don't last for a long time. They have their rise, in, uh, Inca maybe the late 1300s, but they both have their rise largely in the 1400s. And by the 1500s, Spain is arriving and they're going to be conquering both of these places. Um, one note between the Aztec and the Inca, Inca South America and the Andes Mountains, Aztec in Mexico, Central Mexico, uh, they're both going to be big, vibrant civilizations, right? Some historians have to put a little asterisk, though, in their definition of what a civilization is, because they've long talked about civilizations need some way to, like, kind of write and keep written, recorded records. Neither the Aztec nor the Inca had that. They kept records, but not through writing. The Inca, for example, used that system of knots called the quipu, right, or quipu. Uh, they're going to grow differently. The Aztec don't get very big compared to the Inca. The Aztec create more of a tributary empire. They use their military power to exact payment in both money and human sacrifices from their neighbors that they dominate. Whereas the Inca, they grew very big. The Inca needed to continue growing. This is from the Incan practice of what's known as split inheritance. When you are the Inca, the leader of the Inca, the great Inca, when you are the leader of the Inca, you get to rule. When you die, your title goes to your son, but your land, stay, the land you've conquered, stays with the rest of your family. And that leaves the new Inca 
to have to go out and conquer his own territory that can now be his. And then he dies, passes his title down to his son, who then has to go out and get his own land. And so we're going to see the Incan Empire have to continually grow uh, throughout its existence, whereas the Aztec never really get that big. Coolio? Coolio. All right, last but not least, we're going to talk about uh, some of the effects of this expansion. Pardon me. Some of the effects of this expansion, all these interactions, the economic consequences. Uh, this is where we talk about uh, the, the spread of ideas from east to west. I think we already kind of hit on this. New agricultural techniques that will be developed and will spread. I want you to think, uh, let's go back to the Aztec. They have a system where they build what are known as chinampas. Do you guys remember this? Chinampas. This is where the, the Aztec that have a massive city in, what's the city called? Tenochtitlan, I know you'd recognize it if you saw it, but you should be able to write it pretty close. Uh, please don't ever not write something on your AP exam because you don't know how to spell it. Spell it the best you can, and the reader will figure it out. Uh, they're going to build uh, chinampas. Uh, and these are, the, the Aztec have a massive population, and they built their city on, the, on an island in the middle of a lake. So they've got a lot of water, but not a lot of land. So what chinampas are, are they like dredge up the muck from the bottom of the, the lake bed and they use that to grow food on. It's essentially creating new land to grow food on. The Inca have a different problem. They got plenty of land in the mountains, but not enough water. And so they do, does anyone recall in my class what, what we called their system? This was a little tough. What's that? Look at you go, yeah. Waru, waru. Where they would essentially build kind of like uh, ditches. Uh, to trap a lot of rainfall so it couldn't get away so they could hold on to that rainfall even in the high mountains where it would normally make its way down. Yeah? The, well, the pur what, what is the purpose? Yes, know the purpose. To grow more food. Yeah. Don't mix them up. <laughs> I don't know. Learn them. Um, yeah, don't mix them up. Um, how about this? Waru, waru. I flip a W around and it looks like a mountain. Eh? And then you can catch water inside the mountain. I don't know. Whatever. You do what you need to do. You do, know, you do what you need to do. Um, we're going to have new developments in Western Europe for farming. The three field system. Crop rotation. Uh, a moldboard plow. And you use something like an iron plow that's going to help you uh, cultivate more land. Right? Um, developing of a horse collar. So your horses can pull a, a plow without choking themselves out. We're going to see the spread of, of rice, Champa rice, from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, a, a kingdom known as Champa at the time, to East Asia and China. This rice is faster growing. You can grow two seasons worth within one season, or two yields within one season. So increased food production. Now, throughout history, increased food production means increased populations. Increased populations, increased food production means more specialization of labor, means more vibrant civilizations because there's more people doing different kinds of jobs. Um, one other agricultural development, we're going to see this both in Central or South America and we see it in East Asia, is terracing of land. What were you going to say? Three field system in, in Europe more, but but terracing where we we take a mountain, right, and we're going to cut steps in the side of that mountain so we can create flat land to grow food on. Uh, that's where you could link up the development of new agricultural techniques with an impact on the environment. When we are cutting away the sides of mountains, we are absolutely impacting the natural environment. Uh, we're going to see far more population growth, far more urbanization in this period. The growth of cities throughout the world. And in some of these cities, we're going to see, um, you know, sometimes unsanitary conditions, the spread of diseases being an issue. This is going to contribute to the devastation of the Black Plague. Uh, so it's not just connecting east and west. It's also going to be because we're existing at a time with more urbanization that is going to allow diseases to spread much more. We will see... Um, Religions, of course, spread. During this period, we'll see Christianity spread from southern Europe all the way up to northern Europe. By about the year 1000, Christianity has made it all the way up to the Vikings' land. But the religion, I think, that spreads the most during this period, of course, is going to be what? Islam. Very good. 
Um, we will see new systems of labor developed during this time period. Now, slavery is something that's always existed, but it's certainly going to expand, and we talked about its expansion in part due to the connection with the Islamic world. In Western Europe, you guys will remember us talking about uh, craftsmen's guilds, right? Labor associ associations of skilled craftsmen who would protect the labor that they produced. The development of the institution of the serf, both in, in Western Europe, but also Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, and then we're also going to see peasant laborers um, in debt to their, their landlords in Japan. Throughout every society, we will see um, systems of coerced labor and conscription, whether it be for military service or uh, in China, for example, in the Sui Dynasty, to build the Grand Canal. You're going to force your workers to, to do that. Um, in the Incan Empire, they use a system known as the Mita to recruit workers and, and, and provide labor for the state. All right? Um, I think that is a pretty quick run through all of the big stuff that you guys need to know for period three. I don't think, I, I think you still need to look in your review books. I think you still need to get in whatever test prep book you're looking at, but I think we've got a pretty good idea if you're comfortable with the stuff we talked about today.